ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are not aware, internationally renowned cyber law and IP and media law expert. Uh, she is practicing, so practicing in Supreme Court of India, High Court of Delhi, and many other uh, courts. She is an accomplished author, policy maker, and highly inspiring speaker at conferences, print, electronic media, and television. We see her very often on television these days, of course. Uh, Dr. Seth is a founder of is the founder of Seth Associates, an established law firm based in Delhi, operates out of Noida. She has office in Noida, so to work for two things. Uh, her contribution to growth and development of cyber laws in India and internationally is widely acknowledged in the corporate world. She has been empaneled as a member of the working group of ICANN, uh, the, uh, the organization which gives numbers and names uh, in the cyberspace, uh, formed to design the policy framework impacting global domain registration services. She contributes to various working group consultations aimed at design policies for uh, emerging technology. She is also associated with FICI, CII, NASCOM, DSCI, ASUCHAM, uh, and other industry bodies and is highly recommended as cyber lawyer, policy maker, law enforcement, and corporate educator in cyber laws. She is uh, part of international uh, legal think tanks and that uh, especially for working for the women and child empowerment. She has been an expert on the panel of U the expert panel of UNICEF working on the online safety and actively associates with International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, in its think tanks in India. Dr. Seth also has founded a philanthropic organization, Foundation for Institutional Reform and Education to promote cyber awareness and particularly works for empowering women and children. Uh, she has uh, she was uh, conferred the Great Indian Women Award 2021, National Gaurav Award in 2017 for exemplary contribution to cyber laws. She received the Digital Empowerment Award in 2015 and Law Day Award from Chief Justice of India for her book Protection of Children on Internet. She also received the Law Day Award in 2012 for her book, Computers, Internet, New Technology Law. This is one area where she excels, uh, you know, bringing in together the law uh, and the uh, technology. Uh, she is a LLB, a LLM from uh, UK and PhD uh, in cyber laws. Uh, she is also a product of uh, Harvard University in Computer Science certification. Uh, a, a real uh, expert in cyber loss as far as we are, uh, our topic is concerned for today. Uh, cyber loss, a corporate perspective is what she will be speaking on. Uh, I can go on and on as far as her accomplishments are, con ac uh, accomplishments are concerned. Over two decades of uh, standing at the bar, that itself speaks uh, a lot, especially when you are practicing in cyber law. Uh, I have uh, uh, been part of the bar associations and I know how difficult it is to excel, but she has chosen a field which is need of the art. Thank you very much for being part of uh, the this session, uh, Dr. Karnika. Uh, over to you. Uh, you have the presentation privileges. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, something that you know we all need upskilling and we're talking about IT and security and this is an excellent uh, initiative of yours. Uh, I congratulate the entire senior team of uh, Isaac for uh, taking up this uh, initiative of you know holding this cyber cyber awareness and cyber safety uh, and cyber law education uh, cohorts program that is uh, you know for scholars and uh, to all the distinguished uh, you know uh, I would say audience today. Um, I wish you all a very happy army day as well and Makar Sakranti too. So uh, we would start on this note uh, today on cyber laws, you know, talking about cyber law is uh, a huge uh, paradigm in itself. And uh, I know I may, may not be able to do justice to entire like, you know, time that we have because there's so much to cover. But uh, I do intend encapsulating uh, briefly the practical insights of having practiced this field for two, two decades. What kind of you know evolution we have seen as practitioners of law, and uh, to take you through this uh, you know entire uh, matrix of uh, the gamut of laws that we have, with what we call as cyber laws. So with this, I'll start the presentation. I'll just uh, share the screen. Um, I'm just trying to. Uh, see where this will be uh, or could that be uh, uploaded from your end uh, no it's coming on now your share okay i think uh, the screen uh, are you able to see it uh, now yes, it's, uh, yeah. you make it in presentation mode yes, as of now it's in edit yeah. mode are you able to see it now yes it's visible okay. very well 
So uh, we are talking about cyber law today. And uh, when we say cyber law, uh, there are, uh, as I said, entire gamut of laws which come into play, you know, when we talk about cyber law, it's not just cyber crime, or it's not just uh, how we manage the whole cyber security system of the country. But, um, you know, the issue of uh, authentication, the issue of signatures, the issue of um, damages which are payable for any uh, you know contraventions and uh, likewise you know how we'll handle electronic evidence all of these uh, issues are intrinsic to this field of cyber law so we'll be touching on all of them uh, while we doing this uh, presentation now if we see um, the way cyber crime has evolved you know especially during the pandemic uh, there's so much which has happened uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, cyber crime, especially not only just crime against property and crime against people, but also crime against companies. We've seen a huge leap, you know, in terms of uh, kind of crimes which have evolved around this time, especially during the pandemic. So 500% growth is what we have seen in the past two years or so. And while, while when the pandemic just started at that point, it was, uh, you know, uh, said that there would be 86% of uh, rise, but now in today's times, we are already seeing a 500% growth. So the crimes obviously vary. You know, when we talk about the kind of crimes, we'll be talking about them. Uh, for example, you know, uh, we've seen a lot of ransomware increase in this time, data thefts, which have happened in the WFH environment, and uh, lots of uh, QR code scams uh, with payment apps. Uh, and of course, fake medicines and fake, uh, you know, uh, vaccination drive scams, uh, they've percolated the cyberspace. So we'll be talking about each of them, but before that, I just want to give you a very basic insight on the IT Act 2000. It started, you know, that this was enacted in 2000 and uh, 20 years from now, you know, from then on, uh, there have been amendments from time to time, but by and large, it was enacted to authenticate or to give legal recognition to electronic records, e-filing and other, uh, you know, give a basic paraphernalia of sections, which will lie or the, the main uh, matrix or the infrastructure on which it will be the cyber security system or the cyber law system will be built in the country. So it broadly talks about the, uh, the attracting the jurisdiction, first of all, where the jurisdiction will lie, for example, in civil cases or in criminal cases, and uh, where, uh, you know, what acts like unauthorized access, for example, to any data amounts to, uh, you know, a contravention under 43, then hacking would be if there is an intentional unauthorized access or damage to a particular data. Then, uh, you know, there have been various offenses which are probably not even mentioned in the IT Act, but uh, they're already part of the general law in the IPC. I'm sure you would have gone through uh, most of them You're using these sections probably in the everyday uh, balance. But uh, what I wanted to bring to you was the case studies. We'll be discussing some real life cases which we've handled, and that will give you more, uh, you know, practical insight into what kind of issues we've really dealt with. So, uh, having said that, the prescriptive jurisdiction, you know, of IT Act is very wide. So any pretty outside India also, if he commits an offense affecting a computer system or data in India is uh, liable under the IT Act. It is a different matter altogether, whether how we are able to enforce it and to what extent, but prescriptive jurisdiction does lie. Now, uh, when we talk about, you know, IT Act, we also have sections on electronic signatures. Now, even uh, Aadhaar authentication, uh, you know, for when we talk about EKYC uh, through Aadhaar, even that is recognized by the IT Act. Uh, most of the times, whenever they have to e-file, even in the courts, you know, there is a voluntary basis on, you know, giving your Aadhaar OTP-based uh, verification or they can use digital signatures, token-based or otherwise. So that is also a possibility. That's recognized as valid signatures under the IT Act as well. Then legal recognition is being given to electronic contracts. So if, for example, there's an offer and acceptance and have two parties enter into an, like an electronic agreement, it's very well uh, known now that it is a legally uh, valid contract under Section 8, 10A of the, uh, 10 of the IT Act. So uh, likewise, during pandemic or otherwise, all contracts have happened online using various services like Docu uh, DocuSign or otherwise, the parties have been able to enter into contracts. 
then there's another aspect of IT Act. Certifying authorities, they uh, give out, you know, issue out digital signatures. And uh, then there are also civil and criminal liabilities laid down under the IT Act, out of which the most, uh, you know, rampantly used is the 43 and the 43A of the IT Act, where um, unauthorized access, damage to any data or alteration of data is uh, punishable uh, with civil penalties and compensation can be claimed with adjudicating authority under the IT Act. Then uh, when we talk about, you see, uh, the role of the adjudicating authority, they give compensation. He's a secretary IT in almost every state has the authority to look at those cases and de deal with those cases and give out compensation to parties who are affected. For example, we've done cases where, uh, you know, there was an unauthorized debit <clears throat> made to a customer's account who was a marine engineer and was traveling on seas when uh, his uh, debit, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the debit cards were, uh, you know, unauthorizedly used and uh, that uh, particular transactions were almost 98 transactions which happened uh, during a short span of few days and uh, reversals of those amounts were being shown in this bank statement. So, obviously, there was a criminal case lodged as well as a civil case and um, the, uh, the banks had not, you know, <clears throat> the bank had not uh, complied with the RBI directions. The RBI directions are mandate to actually uh, follow the security parameters, sending uh, you know, the OTP on the uh, you know the security. Like you know, you have the various um, uh, registered emails or uh, registers phone numbers. No messages had gone across on those, and there were various other issues. You know, uh, apart from the ISO certifications not being in place, the audits not being in place. So uh, there was a, a compensation granted in such a case. And then uh, there is obviously another uh, forum, which is appeal. So TDSAT is a new forum, which is, uh, you know, been empowered with this uh, right, you know, and uh, they basically look at cases which have gone in appeal from adjudicating authority. So interesting, uh, you know, issues arise. So if banking ombudsman has not probably resolved a particular case, one can obviously go to these authorities under the IT Act. Now, this brings me to criminal cases. In criminal cases, the power to investigate, you know, is uh, with the inspector and above now. So, uh, in that uh, regard, whenever there is a cyber crime, uh, you know, what we normally do is immediately ask the party to uh, file the case, uh, a complaint before the uh, nearest police station or the cybercrime.gov.in portal. And then uh, the Electronic evidence is obviously preserved, so screenshots of those are also filed along with the complaint and uh, the various sections of IT Act which get attracted in a case are also mentioned there. And uh, then, you know, uh, the following up of those cases happens and there is an investigation by the police for, you know, various uh, aspects like IP address tracing, uh, contacting the service provider to get uh, the, uh, you know, exact location from where this particular uh, fake ID, for example, was created or a fake email was created or posts were made. So I will be discussing uh, those cases too. But in one of the interesting cases uh, which we had handled, uh, the IP address was traced to a, a place near Kurgaon. And in that case, uh, the senior level officer of uh, an uh, Indian uh, like, you know, company of, of uh, MNC was um, defamed, defamed through various means on social media or otherwise. And when those emails were tra traced and those posts were traced, they were found to be from a particular IP address in Gurgaon. So when that was tracked, uh, that location was found to be a cyber cafe. And then after that, uh, it was, you know, determined that, you know, this uh, somebody who who rampantly uses the cyber cafe, who, who is the person, there was an ex-employee who they suspected. So when it was interviewed, you know, that particular person was uh, basically uh, uh, investigated, the, the particular computers of those, the cafe were investigated, it was found through softwares and otherwise, that that employee, that same ex-employee had actually used the cafe. So, uh, therefore, I mean, in these kind of cases, a lot of uh, cooperation is needed from service providers and thankfully they have started, you know, giving us the data needed to uh, actually, uh, you know, pinpoint lately, say, from where it is happening. 
But the challenge nowadays is, you know, the software, the technology which is available to criminals. Uh, specifically, you know, when they use VPNs, proxy servers, or TOR, or other uh, kind of you know, equipment, obviously tools, they are able to camouflage uh, many cases, you know, their IP. But yet, it can be still tracked in many cases. It's not that it's foolproof, but uh, there are challenges to that to the law enforcement authorities. Now, this slide, you know, basically captures the kind of uh, laws which we are really using special laws when uh, different cases are involved when they are trademarked law you know, cases, domain thefts, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, when we deal with domain name disputes, uh, there are a lot of uh, trademark violations, a fake um, or similar looking deceptive trademark may be, you know, uh, incorporated within a domain. Uh, and that is uh, something which is actionable in law as well. And it could be a POXO case where a child has been targeted online by stalking or sextortion rackets. Uh, there are fake email IDs created, there are fake uh, social media handles created, phishing scams. Uh, so different uh, provisions of different laws apply depending on what, what particular facts of a case are. Now, when we talk about corporate fraud, specifically since we are talking about corporate perspective, I want to take you through this slide, the kinds of crimes, you know, which uh, percolate today. For example, now man in the middle attacks. I'll just give you a live example of what happened in one of these cases which we handled. Uh, the exporter and uh, the, you know, uh, buyer located in two different jurisdictions. And uh, the, the accounts team of those jurisdictions, when they worked on those, uh, you know, uh, transactions, fake email ID, one of the employees inside us created fake email ID and that email ID uh, was being used by, you know, to uh, change the invoice and the details of the invoice therein. And when that was uh, done, uh, the buyer actually didn't suspect that and all the transactions were happening on email and you know, the monies were siphoned off to some other location. So these are all very rampant cases, you know. Um, and what I wanted to inform you, uh, you know, and let you know is a lot of times, you know, people don't contact on phones. And because of that, uh, there is, a, you know, a lack of communication. And these frauds are very easily, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it just uh, is so easy. So as a social engineering technique, uh, that, you know, one needs to be, uh, you know, very, very careful uh, of what what can transpire if one doesn't uh, really, you know, look at these uh, transactions you know, very carefully with a lot of prudence, especially counting transactions. So if you see uh, the kind of other cases which uh, have arisen in this time frame, malware attacks, for example. Now, when we say malware attacks, ransomware is one of the most rampant ones at this point of time. And uh, encrypting of the entire data, you know, through a particular link or encryption, uh, or uh, rather the whole hard disk can be encrypted. And that has led to a lot of loss of business uh, in a number of cases which we handled. It's not easy to also find the key very easily. Sometimes they are available, but the key to decrypt may not be available. And if you don't have a backup, obviously it's a corporate challenge, you know, for any organization uh, to retrieve its data. And people have paid with bitcoins. People have paid, uh, you know, to uh, retrieve the data. And sometimes it is uh, fully retrieved. Sometimes it is not retrievable. So uh, these cases again fall under cybercrime, and one reports them, and you know, but takes action. But whatever is a loss of data, one doesn't have a backup, suffers for that. Then uh, what we also advocate here is, you know, we need to have routine checks and balances of data, what, what backups we keep and how we keep, because there is also, uh, you know, deemed liability of directors under the IT Act. So if you don't uh, ensure correct practices, specifically if you're dealing with uh, customer data and you've not kept the data secure with the parameters that are supposed to be followed under IT Act, and with the PDP bill coming into play, there will be more stringent liability. And therefore, it's essential to have the best practices and audits in order. So that brings me to you know other problems like fake news. Uh, a lot of it has been said in the media about it. But uh, 
people uh, fall for fake news and enter you know into transactions like uh, auctions or uh, buying uh, bitcoins or other kind of uh, you know uh, relying on certain terrorist attack or other kinds of news uh, or buying certain other products or offers of employment and land up in trouble so those are either fake news or they are phishing scams uh, which steal people's data and also you know land they end up paying monies for for no reason and they, they get duped so um, with the identity theft uh, it's generally coupled with phishing because there is a fake id which is created and generally id of a person who is probably known you know somebody who's a colleague or someone uh, who is a, a another partner in a, or associated in another jurisdiction or a land uh, identity is stolen using various uh, mechanisms i mean it could be an email id it could be a phone number and interestingly on 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 the internet we know that it's very easy to send an sms using uh, you know uh, or or call using voip with a fake identity it takes a matter of seconds to do that and people generally get duped even with that uh, and involving payment scams like qr code scams uh, the criminal would ask for a qr code to be sent and you know uh, the person shares it and he doesn't realize the money is not coming into the payment like that e wallet but it is actually going out from his account so those kind of scams are also we have dealt with where doctors have been duped uh, you know there was um, uh, a very popular like famous scam which is happening in delhi and cr where a uh, product had to be bought and you know payment apps were being used misused rather by criminals to commit these crimes so uh, then there have been uh, issues of you know sex extortion you know been mentioned in the slide but again a lot of them uh, using social media contacting a stranger acting uh, as if they want to be friends and then they would land up you know doing certain things which are illegal capture the photographs uh, in you know uh, or uh, conversations and later on blackmail the person that you know uh, somebody's personal chat or personal information would be sent online those are you know demanding monies uh, through blackmail and that's a huge uh, sexual extortion racket where both children and even senior citizens or uh, in fact anybody can fall uh, you know uh, a trap or be trapped by these kind of scams so there have been lots of those uh, kind of issues as well then snooping you know again it's like interception uh basically uh intercepting somebody's conversation or otherwise uh through phone or through chats using various malware um you know it's like even cctvs have been hacked and uh, in in uh, various uh, establishments uh, or even homes and that uh, you know snooping of chats and phone conversations uh, is again a very rampant thing and in many cases you know uh, the uh, encrypted messages is also been a part of challenge but then uh, with encrypted uh, messages it's still fine uh, you know you have some degree of uh, reliance you can place on it but other conversations which are not protected they have been a matter of challenge in many cases so this basically gives you uh, a short overview of what kind of cases uh, we regularly see in the cyberspace but especially during covid pandemic there have been fake donation scams malware attacks and uh, through various video conference apps even uh, you know online apps which people are using or uh, web platforms for conversations uh, sometimes uh, it, it pandemic necessitated that you know the sensitive conversations also happen through various uh, software but then most of them which are paid are, are safe there was an issue about zoom but then i think a lot of features got added as well and so it was uh, advisories were given by certain regarding uh, you know how safely they can use such platforms so uh, this brings us to the offenses part i have told you about the trends the the models of identity and how these scams are happening but then uh, when we talk about law and application of law we regularly use these sections for uh, hacking we use section 66 cheating by personation we use 66d violation of privacy somebody creating a, a you know a, a violation of 
somebody's uh, pictures have been taken or video has been taken again 66 e child pornography 67 b likewise these are the sections cyber terrorism we have 66 f it's most stringent up to life imprisonment uh, has been given as a punishment here but in other cases most of them uh, barring child pornography which is five years of punishment uh, there have been mostly these uh, other offenses with three years of punishment and fine so uh, most of them again being ba bailable but uh, non-bailable uh, are those offenses which are you know with a punishment of above three years uh, or more so that's how uh, the criminal uh, you know offenses uh, you know the matrix of these uh, sections is but the most important challenge right at the outset happens you know when whenever a case comes to us it's like you know what where do we file a complaint so uh, and it's not you know, initially crimes were being committed, uh, mostly, you know, the issues would come within a particular territory. So it's related to India. Now the crimes are no more just uh, location or, you know, in like country specific. So we've dealt with those cases where they're cross border crimes. There are often now, I think I would, if I can tell you, uh, most of 60, 70% cases are happening where, uh, uh, a lot of corporate cases I'm talking about where co cross-border crime is involved and more than a single jurisdiction is often involved in those crimes. And there, uh, the issue is where has the offense been committed from? Is part of the offense also committed in India? We look at all these parameters. And even cases of defamation, uh, if an act is done in one jurisdiction, but the consequences felt in another jurisdiction, both the jurisdictions have, uh, you know, you can you can actually file a complaint, and so uh, these are the you know issues. And apart from that, we've also dealt with cases when somebody is not in uh, you know in the national borders, uh, really territory or land, even if they're on sea. So uh, their uh, issues are different. So you know, there if it's a ship or an aircraft, whether that aircraft was registered in India or that a ship was registered in India. So uh, there we have to use all these you know, aspects also to determine jurisdiction. Uh, I think one of the most interesting slides of this whole presentation will be this one, because we are talking about uh, real cases. Uh, so there have been a multiple different, different defamation cases uh, where celebrities or otherwise, you know, people who have been defamed online, uh, whether it's through trolling or it's through email, or it is through television broadcast programs, uh, or if it is, you know, uh, through uh, say anonymous communication uh, to various people. So th th there are different levels of, do, you know, having a, a defamation case and different modus of friendly used everywhere. So we have, you know, seen those cases and dealt with those cases where uh, we look for injunction orders. We seek injunction orders from the court to block such defamatory content out. And we have to usually rope in you know, the service providers who have been used because the tracing of the IP and that has to be done you know, to find who the person is behind the whole racket. So uh, in those cases, defamation, uh, we seek compensation as well as uh, immediate injunction orders are being uh, you know, uh, obtained from the court. Then uh, there have been, you know, cases where hacking of uh, servers has happened. This is one of the most challenging cases which we actually dealt with. And uh, this uh, was a case where a foreign company, a real estate company was uh, hacked uh, through uh, its own service provider who had a back office in India. And the tracing uh, on the same, you know, was the server was done and uh, it was using a particular interface called Jira. If you if you know about that, uh, there was a transfer of the IP. They were actually engaged to create a website, and when the website was created uh, and the handover of the website with the entire proprietary material was given, it was later on stolen by the same back office which worked on it. So uh, there, the challenge was to uh, you know say that the jurisdiction should be India because after all, the hacking took place from India and uh, the raid was committed and then you know the police confiscated the servers and uh, during that time uh, the entire systems which were used to co commit these crimes were, were sealed and you know 
brought to the court uh, with the local commissioner. And there, in such cases, the forensic took place, and it was found that yes, uh, you know, there was uh, traces of you know hacking, and you know, could one could still find it, even though the hard disks were manipulated and you know other other issues percolated in this case. But uh, what I am trying to uh, emphasize here is that. It is a, a challenge to work on such cases with law enforcement authorities. Uh, however, it is still easier in such a scenario where, uh, you know, the back office, for example, in this case, or the accused in this case is in India. The challenge is when the accused has fled India, you know, after committing the offense or somebody who is involved is outside in collusion with somebody outside India. So then the MLAT process and, you know, uh, the entire Way of getting evidence from abroad is is an issue because it's not so quick. The cooperation treaties or the bilateral treaties, uh, though Interpol and other, uh, you know, in, I would say bilateral treaties do play a very important role here. But tampering of such data or non-availability is always a risk because it is uh, tamperable as well. So that is um, a challenge. And then there have been cases where uh, social media profiles, you know, uh, have been uh, again created fake handles using VPN uh, or Tor or other, uh, you know, softwares and tools. And that uh, camouflaging one's identity and then creation of such profiles. Yet a lot of times, you know, the accused may not be so clever. At at times, it's very easy to trace them, and uh, you know, you even you can. You know, pinpoint you ge geographically where exactly what latitude, longitude this is come from. There are tools available to do that. So, uh, I'm sure you're using that on a, a very usual and ordinary basis. And uh, there are obviously, you know, uh, possibilities of even tracking the cell tower data and uh, you know other uh, uh, gadgets which may be involved and who are the uh, close contacts who are actually working in a racket with that with that particular person, and that's again available through softwares. And uh, there are uh, various tools. Uh, I think there's one uh, uh, tool for social media called Asma, also which uh, India uses as law enforcement uses for the same. So uh, interestingly, in one of the cases, uh, we posed using that tool because uh, one can actually find uh, the accused and connected people alongside it. You know, to track a particular uh, case. Then there have been, uh, you know, data theft cases. Very interesting. We have dealt with many of these uh, data theft cases where ex-employee has been, uh, you know, involved, and uh, there was a stealing of uh, copyrighted and other kinds of data, and whether it's client database or other uh, sensitive data, and that is used by the criminal to, uh, you know, siphon off monies or, uh, you know. It, it would be even to uh, dupe uh, the customers of the company through sending various mails. But primarily in data theft cases, uh, the data is misused by a uh, ex-employee to create a parallel company alongside even when he's working or maybe after he leaves uh, the employment. So that uh, is also a challenge because there again, uh, you know, the forensics of, of the system that he used has to be done. And um, then also uh, what kind of emails have gone you know, using uh, a particular uh, service provider. So getting that data, if it's not available in the system or he has formatted or deleted the entire trace, then uh, looking at the server, uh, is uh, the organization using DLP or not? So data loss prevention software, all these things become important and we use those screenshots and we use, uh, we've used in the past uh, access data and other kind of, you know, uh, companies and software for taking, you know, evidence and, and then filing it in the court of law in a proper manner. I'll be coming to electronic evidence, but before I do that, uh, there was uh, one more uh, interesting uh, case which uh, we recently handled uh, last week or 10 days ago, which was um, a particular uh, person using, you know, social media uh, was contacted um, you know, uh, had contacted uh, certain people uh, asking for monies because he would blackmail the person, uh, you know, having uh, personal pictures of the person or, uh, you know, videos of the person. And there was uh, a sextortion racket again. Uh, there, uh, the 
the accused was uh, actually caught and arrested and then he was behind bars. So these kind of cases, uh, the service providers need to cooperate and also give, you know, apart from the confiscated gadgets which are used, um, the service providers have to you know, give out data. And uh, in many cases, they do provide now in a sealed cover the uh, IP addresses from where these uh, particular case you know, posts were made or particular communications happened. And that is then utilized to actually uh, you know, see whether the offense was committed by an X person or a Y person and from what location. So uh, having said that, I mean, these are just a tip of the iceberg, what I have told you, but uh, the cyber law, we have really seen a huge uh, rise in kinds of cases and multiple cases actually don't involve a single offense. They are having multiple offenses alongside. So that becomes very interesting indeed. And all these sections, which you see, uh, you know, on, on the slide uh, become important. In cases of uh, personal data breaches, you know, we've, we've used uh, the right to privacy and right to be forgotten. Because now uh, there was an interesting case where uh, a person claimed his right to be forgotten after his uh, domestic case was settled up, you know, and he obviously didn't want his name to be shown in the case law database or news reports and uh, there have been uh, you know cases where right to be forgotten is now being utilized uh, very well in india and right to privacy is obviously there so uh, that's again uh, something we rampantly use now just this ks putaswami case and then uh, in number of cases uh, you know injunction orders have been obtained uh, with with the help of these uh, case laws and in many cases, uh, when we talk about electronic evidence, we use 65B certificates because in the evidence law, um, there is a requirement that the, um, you know, the in charge of a computer system or needs to give a certificate saying that this was, uh, you know, this data which has been taken and produced before court of law is uh, something which is authentic. And uh, it is an um, original and uh, nothing has been tampered with it. Uh, no uh, computer system at that particular point of time, it was uh, not malfunctioning and everything was in order. Those kind of uh, declarations have to be given unless you're producing the original uh, device itself. So if you're producing the original device, you needn't give that, but if 65V is needed, if there is a secondary evidence involved. And that has been now, law has been very clearly laid down under the Arjun Pandit judgment. Uh, which which reconciles and rather overrules, you know, uh, the Shafi Mohammed case, and then talks about the uh, PV, uh, you know, uh, Anwar versus PV Bashir case has been reaffirmed in this. So this um, basically gives a very clear view that when you use 65B certificate and when you don't need to use 65B. Now, in most of these cases, uh, plastic money frauds or otherwise. What is the first thing that one does? Obviously, one reports it to the bank, one reports it to the police, and one tries to block the credit cards or the debit cards. And if a server is hacked, uh, in, in cases of bank frauds, uh, there's a zero liability for the customer if he immediately informs the bank about it. And uh, you know, one obviously registers a police complaint and emergency helplines are available. So these are very, very basic, uh, I would say, best practices. One you know, uh, advices on, you know, in such cases. And this is the portal. We are all, I'm sure, familiar with it. Uh, so we report the crime reporting portal. And uh, then the police starts working and they start collecting information and evidence. So evidence is obviously collected through various means. When you talk about gadgets or you talk about laptop or a device, maybe a mobile phone or a server, cell data, tower data, it could be even getting service provider data. So with the help of all these, uh, you know, data, and if it's a protected system, there's a different protocol, which is followed altogether. So that is looked at and investigation happens, followed with a charge sheet, and then the case goes into trial with the charges. So that's how we, uh, you know, have seen practice of uh, cyber crime and cyber law and convictions are few. I agree, convictions are few because uh, till the time the case actually happens and, you know, isn't prosecuted, the whole uh, journey 
is long and in india we do take long in terms of backlog we have huge backlog but thankfully uh, you know issues of bank frauds are being resolved quickly with ombudsman being there but still there are uh, you know those are uh, certain monies being, being uh, you know recovered or you know pay bank settles out with the payments but in cases of criminal cases you know we need a special uh, cyber crime you know courts to handle cyber crime very few courts and there's no special court really uh, except for you know crimes against women and children we don't find many uh, you know cyber crime courts really have you know installed and that, that that's something which we really need to work on and i've always advocated that now this uh, slide basically captures what i also uh, just discussed the urgent for the trial judgment so uh, in a line or uh, i can just summarize it that you don't need to produce 65b certificate if you're producing the original uh, evidence but uh, the device itself but you do need it when you you're relying on secondary evidence whether it's audio video or otherwise uh, or a photocopy or a printout of an email or a chat all this can be produced as evidence now uh, let me just take you through uh, some uh, you know frauds which have happened especially pandemic related frauds now fake donation sites i mentioned uh, people have not gone to see whether it's a real or uh, who site and they've paid donations there have also uh, been cases of pmk as a relief fund you know uh, fake handles being created and those were blocked you know that's also been there many phishing sites being blocked and uh, in the in this time frame you've seen fake mails coming from authorities as if they're coming from uh, you know original authentic authorities and people have realized they they can actually track fake news now by going to original newspaper and or using websites like photometer fact check uh, so now people are more cyber aware and that's a good sign because uh, many of these services are free and uh, they just need to be informed that they can't just click on every and any link which comes on social media. So uh, having discussed the first part of uh, the presentation, which is basically to talk about practical insights of these cases, but second part of it really concentrates on the best practices. Because uh, we all understand many of these issues would have been probably covered, like, you know, but I thought it will be good to just cover a few of them and say that what we need to do when we need to be safe online and one wants to advise anybody or even adopt yourself those measures as a corporate world we have seen many tools which have been useful uh, and you know when i spoke for chambers of commerce many of those presentations we discussed this during wfh times uh, what one needs to do so uh, out of common sense, we all understand whenever we're using software, it has to be updated, OS has to be updated, Wi-Fi has to be a secure Wi-Fi, and deployment of anti-spyware and antivirus is every is there on every individual device or phone also now. And obviously, uh, many of these issues involve uh, common sense, as in not clicking on every link that you find, reading terms of service. The other day I was just uh, downloading an app and I realized myself that how much information uh, it was actually asking for without the need uh, to do, uh, you know, anything to do with that information. So if it's a nutrition app or if it's a health app or otherwise, they are taking information like your photographs, your videos, um, your gallery access, your contacts access. I don't know why somebody has to do that. I mean, why should somebody, it's, a, it's your after all right to privacy and you don't have to use your original names either. So you can register on a site or even use it without registration. And that's something which many of us are not aware or may not be you know, looking into these issues, but later on they create a havoc. So uh, using digital signatures to factor authentication and obviously checking the original websites is important. Usage of VPNs uh, is also recommended, data loss prevention softwares. And when we've advised, you know, corporates, a lot of times uh, we've called out their work from home policy. We have overhauled their entire structure uh, as an institution. It may have 50 policies in place, but all of them had to be overhauled because they have to be reviewed, keeping in view today's times whether it's IT policy, whether it's home work from home policy, or whether it's data sharing policy or cloud service policy, contracts had to be changed. The 
the entire uh, gamut of policies had to be changed and uh, who has permission to access which data the entire you know hr you know the way they work the manpower and the pedigree of you know access and it would also require recording of audit trail so uh, everything had to be uh, you know relooked because of the pandemic the whole system of working has changed so deployment of tools is one aspect uh, overhauling of policies is another aspect and then ad advising them on what they need to do as in terms of backup or emergency incident response making a, a, a kind of incident response policy those were all interesting issues uh, which we got to work on then digital signatures uh, use of pki and then you know when we talk about encryption and how they would like to keep it whether it will be a private cloud they're using or a hybrid cloud they're using the use of password managers and obviously trainings so we have i think on every level uh, tried to handhold our clients and you know customers on how they need to understand this whole change in the working environment and adapt themselves with resilience and you know be open to changes that they need to deploy within their organization both technically and legally you know make it compliant so those have been certain uh, you know issues and changes uh, that you can see on the slides various uh, you know kind of technologies with try to use uh, even uh, blockchain or otherwise you know in certain uh, sectors of uh, work or industry and usually uh, we look at the 16 steps here you know and every step is important so when we talk about security of a particular organization right from their posting to uh, you know their uh, gdpr compliance uh, and interestingly we've also worked on companies who have uh, customers in europe so looking at uh, not just companies abroad who are doing business in india but we had to do uh, a cross audit of uh, or a cross compliance of companies from india who are doing uh, work business with european customers or handling their data to be gdpr compliant so therefore you know the, the intermingle of law and technology has become so so intrinsic that uh, we as a practitioner of law or, or you know practitioners of law cannot function without technical uh, understanding of this whole system and ecosystem so uh, thanks to the industry experts and you know security and you know alignment of uh, laws and amendments which have happened that uh, you know working on these issues has become uh, interesting and uh, i think uh, i must congratulate isaac for uh, creating this sort of a program because it does uh, bring to table the expertise of every stakeholder in terms of security, technical, who's handling forensics, who's handling the law enforcement, the, the lawyers, the courts, you know, and how the entire system will function. It brings it to a seamless, uh, I think, uh, you know, place, which is important. Uh, to bring to a, a single page, a, you know, understanding of all parties and the perspectives of all parties. So, uh, like I'm talking today to you, you would understand how we as lawyers and, you know, uh, handholding the corporates uh, help them both to prevent crime and, and problems within their organization or the compliance issues. At the same time, we handle cases which come about when they have problems and there are incidents and what is to be done, you know, to bring the case uh, before a court of law to get the legal recourse which they really need at that particular point of time, whether it's civil or it's criminal. So um, I am very happy to share all this with you today. There are lots of resources available, uh, even on our website, which you can uh, maybe look at. And uh, there are also, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I would say, ebooks and books. And the latest one uh, is the newest edition, you know, the last uh, uh, one is the Computers, Internet, New Technology Laws. And that is uh, up to date. It was uh, just published, uh, I think, last month. And, you know, that's updated uh, law of cyber law in India and US, UK and Europe. So we've covered uh, insights into all these jurisdictions because a lot of them get used, you know, in terms of cases and handling cases each time. So you uh, can look at that. Plus, there are lots of ebooks on Amazon, so uh, which I have authored. So 
So you can, you know, various aspects, whether it's, uh, it's mostly topical, uh, depending on which topic interests you, you can you know, look at that. But yes, the main compendium, the sort of reference work is, is uh, the, the most updated one is this one, Computers, Internet, New Technology Laws. So uh, with this, I think I would go to the interaction phase. Uh, if you permit, uh, this is where I'll stop the presentation and we can start discussions, um, giving you enough time to uh, take up, you know, good questions and uh, look at more uh, practical issues uh, you know, from a practical standpoint. Thank you very much, uh, Karnika. Koshi, uh, yeah, yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon to you. I have two questions actually. One is as an advocate, can we invoke ML at when required? Let's say if there's an overseas crime, yeah, is it possible to invoke ML? Yes, sir. You can oh, you have to go through the MEA for that. Yes, that's true. There is a whole procedure of doing so. And uh, I know it is circuitous. Sometimes we also need court orders, uh, you know, to uh, ask uh, the court of the other jurisdiction to help out in getting the evidence from uh, those parties which are based abroad uh, and those service providers which may be based abroad and often they ask for saponia or other warrants you know to give uh, their information and say this is customer centric data we cannot you know give out the data so we will we, we have to in many cases use mlat process as well and uh, courts also play a role in uh, issuing out orders to get evidence from abroad and there are treaties uh, between countries uh, and multilateral treaties also uh, which work on this uh, area yeah other than MLAT, you mean to say yeah i mean there are uh, what what i can say is that there are two countries how they want to cooperate with each other mm -hmm. uh, that is also given out in bilateral treaties as well so there may be some special arrangements which agreed between the two countries that is also looked into Let's say in your law practice, a client comes up with a grievance of blocking a particular website. Yeah. In, in working section 69A, do you have to go through mighty or you can get a court order to invoke 69A, section 69A of IT Act? See, uh, section 69A uh, is something that, you know, it depends on the facts of every case. Now, uh, if a particular uh, post is there or a website is there, which is uh, a threat to national security, right? And you complain. Certain itself also uh, has the right and the power to do that, right? You can block content out. And uh, if if court orders have to be obtained, even those can be obtained, you know, in, in certain situations, uh, you know, where you need to uh, get an injunction. For example, if, if in some of the cases, uh, you know, with one of the cases rather, there was a, a celebrity who was being defamed through a US based site. Now, it was a challenge here that, you know, they will submit to the jurisdiction of Indian courts or not. So the, this case was before the Delhi High Court. And uh, in that, we uh, made the registrar of the website also a party. We made the service uh, provider, the, the, the main service uh, website owner also a party. And uh, well, while the website owner uh, did not submit to jurisdiction of that Indian court, the registrar did. And so the court ordered that if they don't take out that, take down that website, uh, sorry, that particular page out in next 24 hours or 36 hours, the court directed the registrar to block the entire website if they don't do that. You know? So that, that sort of a compliance is also possible. So the court can also give a blocking order. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Any any other question, ladies and gentlemen? Anyone else? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. I, I do have. So first of all, thank, thank you, ma'am, for taking the time on a, a festival weekend. So thank you so much for that. So I had a question regarding, uh, uh, you know, uh, what I observe, and it's been in news also that a lot of corporates and even larger startups, so to speak are continuously uh, exposed to data breaches. Uh, unintentional, intentional is debatable, but the point is that a lot of companies are getting exposed to data breaches. 
and there doesn't seem to be any direct liability on the part of the companies to increase their cyber security practices and you know they continue to be um, you know less vigilant or not necessarily tightening up their security practices uh, what is your view on that is there any law which is already there any law in the making how do we make sure that the corporates become more vigilant and more rather than something being enforced upon them so that is my question uh i understand uh, what what you want to basically convey uh, and i do have share the same sentiment because there is a lot of times that companies uh, you know they are not uh, proactive they are reactive so uh, when we talk about you know vigilance they are not uh, geared up to these challenges and they think that somebody else can be hacked but not us but that's not you know being in reality so it's something that we always uh, advise them that you know you need to have your entire uh, security framework in order and uh, the so software you use the hardware you use or uh, the, the mechanisms to protect your data they should be there right at the outset why should you uh, wait for the crime to be committed just be uh, you know able to prevent it and therefore we uh, you know suggest them tools like dlp or installing firewalls dedicated servers or cloud you know basically all these aspects become very very important to design their whole security system and uh, that's essential and we have done that for for clients so that's important and uh, we don't only get uh, in the picture once the problem occurs and when we are whenever they are negotiating contracts with foreign parties for example or with an indian service provider or otherwise even there we pitch in so we have been there to uh, oversee and look uh, and review that all these aspects have been taken care of right at the contracts to, you know contract stage whether it's employment agreements or it's non compete agreements or it's it policy uh, or engaging another service provider to commit like to a particular service you know to perform a particular side of an undertaking or an assignment all these things are important so i i agree with you one has to look at having the right tools in order the legal compliance and policies in order also contracting in order and then incident response if need be thank you thank you very much uh, does it answer your question ramke uh, yes sir uh, uh, i i i think what ma'am is uh, basically saying is that currently there is no specific law which enforces them uh, but you know i think all firms all of us have to make sure that we are proactive and make sure that everything is tightened from all ends but uh, i believe that there is no law dictating or prescribing them that they should be taking all measures in a uh, in a upfront manner uh, is that a correct summary I, I want to clarify no, one thing that is not correct summary what i am saying is due diligence due diligence is essential but uh, when it comes to customer data uh it is important whatever data they are saving especially 43a of it act it mandates for example uh, one of the recommended standards is iso 27001 so they have to comply with these uh, standards it's not that uh, there is no uh, i would say uh, obligation on them there obviously those things are there but there are certain other things uh, especially for example banking sector you know Uh, RBI guidelines are there. They have to. There is a mandate. It's not that it's just I've left up to them how they want to manage the data, and it's only between the user and the service provider what they agree. There are guidelines that, but there are still certain areas. For example, deployment of DLP is something that many organizations have started doing. V VPNs. Those specific uh, areas are certainly. they new as new but earlier they these technologies were not available and now they are available so a lot of companies are proactively on their own also adopting certain technologies but whatever is required to be adopted obviously that that is there it's not that that law law doesn't exist there yes 43a is there and for different sectors of industry the their norms and their parameters are there for health industry there is a separate norm and uh, you know the, the medical council obviously has their own guidelines so they have to follow that as well so that is a separate issue altogether yes uh, ramki okay. uh, you got it you got it sectoral yes. 
minimum security standards are in place, part one. NCIIPC gives the regulations for the critical information infrastructure yes. protection. METI has guidelines and regulations on minimum standards for data protection. So there are eight different levels and stages, regulations available, specifying the minimum standards. Now yes. what she is talking about is minimum standards, but what is the latest technology? She also touched upon saying that there are technologies available which can definitely provide higher level of protection. Yes. Now that part is the discretion of the corporates. That part is the discretion of the companies that cannot be imposed upon by the regulators because regulators are looking at minimum standard that is supposed to be followed. The companies Absolutely. will have to look at how to protect further by going for the better technologies, better processes, better people. That's for the companies. This is what is the gist, uh, Prabhki. Yes, I agree. Uh, Colonel Koshi here again. I just one more question. Please. So now, uh, you know, many of the services are going to the cloud. And for in, for the sake of investigation, we need to get, let's say, the AWS uh, logs or some trails or something. Like that. So all that is covered under CRPC 92 or is there any other law in which we can get these logs? CRPC 91. 91, yeah. Yes. Uh, basically, you can get the logs from there. Uh, you know, in US, they have discovery and other processes also. In India, also, we have certain... Uh, procedures like that but uh, by and large in criminal cases they produce logs under section 91 and uh, they are able to uh, get the right data or the ip logs and other uh, you know footprints from the, the concerned agency but if it's a you know company say abroad again the issue becomes how to you know what bilateral treaties exist or how do you get that through MLAT or otherwise you know in inter cooperation between police Interpol involvement. All these things are important. Uh, and sometimes now, nowadays, especially with public grievance officers of the organizations available for, uh, you know, such investigations, they are able to cooperate with law enforcement agencies with dedicated email IDs, they write to each other and they exchange information. So it's possible uh, to get that, uh, you know, in the criminal investigations. No, but in the case of, let us say, a legal uh, litigation, uh, we have to use CRPC 91 through the law enforcement only or we can get a court order also to get this done? We can get a court order. Definitely that jurisdiction, uh, that discretion is uh, with the court also. They can uh, direct the parties to, you know, present that kind of uh, evidence which is needed. But again, uh, the ministry's involvement may be there, the, you know, the whole process is uh, outlined, you know, if it's an extradition, for example, it's a different, uh, you know, uh, entirely uh, different procedure for that. Getting evidence is another aspect. One may not have to come to the court to testify. It can be through a, a dis uh, giving it in a sealed cover along with a 65B evidence uh, certificate. That, that will be possible and you needn't even be cross-examined. In most cases, uh, 65B evidence is, you know, alongside uh, the certificate, the logs are given in the court in the sealed cover. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Sri Shankar, I have one question, ma'am. Thank you very much for the beautiful presentation. Thank you. Um, this is about a misinformation campaign across the country, and there have been a lot of uh, cases which can be termed as criminal, but uh, mm -hmm. what I find is there is no law that can govern that, right? Uh, and although we say that it is all covered under IT Act, um, the aggregators are the biggest source of this misinformation, and uh, the traceability has been a huge challenge in some of the cases. So, in in the absence of uh, of a law governing it, what can uh, what kind of a legal remedy can someone look for to prevent uh, this this sort of a crime? Uh, you know, there is a different uh, category of fake news, you know, the categorization, whether it's disinformation or it's misinformation or if it's fake news really uh, in a broad balance. But 
having uh, looked at a particular uh, case scenario, for example, if it's a news agency, there can be a case against the news agency. Uh, it can also be uh, blocking of its uh, you know, website or if it's a particular news uh, uh, stopping its further circulation. It could also uh, entail uh, suspension of its license if it's very grave. And uh, there are various norms, you know, for example, in advertising, you know, there have been cases where uh, the norms of advertising have been flouted. So what is violated? After all, we have to see where it will fall. And that depends on the content. What is the effect of the content? Is it uh, in larger public interest or is it viol violating only a sectoral guideline? Is it a soft code or is it a proper law? So all those aspects and you know which agency will deal with it? So it will depend on whether it's news, if it's a television program or if it's an advertisement. We look at all these aspects and then see what is the best legal recourse in any, any given scenario. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I have a couple of questions related to that, Dr. Karnika. Sure. Uh, may I ask you? Uh, please, please go ahead. Okay. One, the noise that is around the amendment to the IT rules on the code of conduct and the social media. Mm. What's your view and what is the status? See, um, the new rules, uh, they have uh, various uh, new legal provisions which have been advocated, but again, it's been a matter of challenge and certain provisions have been stayed and, you know, uh, there's a whole, uh, I would say, influx uh, of debate on this whole, uh, whole issue. Uh, it also intermingles issues of personal data protection and uh, how the service providers will cooperate with law enforcement agencies within what time frame. For example, in cases of very obscene materials, 24 hours guideline uh, was you know, being discussed and other cases they have to respond in say 72 hours or otherwise. So there'll, there'll be a lot of new uh, issues you know, which have come about and specifically social media, how uh, I would say, of how obligated is it to give out this information and what kind of preventive measures have to be put in place in terms of due diligence by them? Should it extend to uh, creating a second set of laws uh, which conflicts with or is inc inconsistent with, uh, say, the broadcasting guidelines or the, the newspapers, how they function and they have their own set of norms? Uh, and the codes, uh, codes of conduct, can IT Act transgress into that domain? That that's all being you know discussed and debated. So, I think uh, the terrain uh, has to be very very uh, clear cut because, you know, as you will agree, uh, TRI has its own jurisdiction and area. Likewise, uh, you know, when they created a ban on say not 200 SMHs or more uh, uh, can go across, you know, on a particular day. That ban was by the trial, and that was easily circumvented by using VORP or other mechanisms which are available online. And various messages were being sent, more than 200 messages a day were being sent through that media. So the interface, how they function, the two different agencies, two different set of laws, they have to be clear cut. At the same time, they have to be, you know, taking cognizance of what uh, can be easily circumvented. So both agencies have to be on the same page and that's not happening. You know, the seamless working of two different areas is becoming a challenge for even regulators and to manage two different departments or ministries and yet be able to tackle the problem in a seamless way is a challenge. And therefore such rules when they come about, there is a huge uh, debate on them and often they are challenged. And until they find a clear homogeneity in terms of functionality, how they will function in clear cut roles, there will always be a debate. That's how I feel about it. You know, so when, on a larger, uh, I was a broader perspective. I'm not against creation of rules where they're lacking us, but it has to be within the powers set for that area, and yet also be mindful of what is the other particular agency's role and its functions and powers should not be conflicting with the what has been created. Yeah. A hypothetical uh, proposition, uh, I just seek your comment. Mm -hmm. Had the 
ecosystem been sensitized more on these things? Do you think we would have come out of the self self regulation not being implemented by various agencies, the multiple agencies that you have mentioned? Uh, should, uh, could it have resulted in a better outcomes in this noise that we are seeing? Uh, it's in a utopian concept, I believe, because uh, although I I to a certain extent, because uh, you know when when we talk about issues like net neutrality or other issues, we we think of soft code and you know self regulation. Uh, either we could have had one agency framed which has different stakeholder representation, that could have been you know uh, easier way out to get a utopian sort of a model or of self regulation, or. Um, if it was uh, not like that, then having a self regulation, uh, the concept could vary, uh, you know, by from one stakeholder to another. So, bringing them on the same page would have been a little difficult in US and other countries. You know, there is a, a self regulation model very easily ad adapted because they are talking about freedom of speech and they're very particular on privacy rights and other things. And freedom of the internet, so uh, that's good. Uh, it, the same thing also happens in India, but but uh, there is a, a strong sense of uh, you know, regulation here. So uh, the ministries who are concerned with this uh, deal with those issues, and that's been there not not from now, but from initial times as well. You know whether it's another set of laws, any law in fact, and cyber law being an amalgamation of so many laws, it becomes a challenge because that is a area of law which is an amalgamation of many laws. So when you talk about privacy or you talk about IPR, you talk about broadband, everything is on it, right? So bringing them on the same page with just self-regulation as a sentiment becomes difficult unless there is a body which has sex stakeholder representation and uh, creates a law. It's sort of a PPP model, maybe that could work. Thank you. A uh, very uh, well explained. Uh, that brings me to the next question. Do you think our IT Act has outlived its uh, utility? Uh, is there a need for us to go for revision because uh, the industry 4.0 technologies that we are looking at uh, with uh, the cyber security probably at the core? Uh, do you think there is a need or uh, no? We, we are quite good with the with the law that we have uh, uh, centered around the IT Act? No, I think uh, the basic framework is there in the IT Act, uh, but the pace at which the technology is changing today, I think we need newer amendments and very, very quick amendments. Because uh, by the time the amendment comes into play, a lot of damage is already done. And we can see that, uh, you know, debates around Bitcoin, we can see the debates around personal data protection, they have been going on for long and the the whole set of laws, the, the earlier, the better. That's how I feel. So it needs a quicker uh, time to, you know, be brought into like manifestation because right now the amendments are discussed and debated for long before they come into picture. That's that that creates a lot of, uh, you know, uh, difficult scenario in terms of uh, certain incidents which have already occurred. And then, you know, you're you're actually being reactive in that sense. So looking at what technologies are coming into play, for example, AI today, or blockchain, or bitcoins, there should be some sort of a regulation not to fetter the technology, but to handhold it, I feel. So that's something uh, really needs to be looked at. I know the regulators uh, and law enforcement uh, have a very, very strong view on these new technologies because of its inherent problems. Also, it brings along benefits. So one has to balance out the two. So regulators are right there in their own way. At the same time, the you know internet freedom, um, you know people who are talking about internet freedom, and uh, advocates of the same. Uh, have something important to contribute and say. So there has to be a fine balance, which can come through dialogue, which can come through interaction, and then jointly, you know, creation of think tanks, uh, which can cull out some good uh, practices through which the whole ecosystem is, uh, you know, value is added through those technologies. At the same time, it uh, prevents any kind of problems which are inherent in the same. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, one more question before I ask you that question. 
is there anyone uh, who wants to ask uh, some question to dr karnika yes sir i do uh, hi this is sohil shah thank you sohil uh, go ahead yes. thank you dr karnika i think this is a wonderful presentation uh, i actually did want to ask you a little bit more about ransomware i think i, I really liked how you you uh, you know kind of went through your presentation where you actually showed what are the issues and uh, you know challenges we are facing from a uh, you know, IT security risk perspective, and then you know what are the laws kind of associated with it. So, kind of keeping that same theme, uh, just specifically talking about ransomware. Um, we know that you know ransomware is definitely rampant. We've seen massive amount of attacks right now, and um, you know the only cure or only solution you have. Um, you know, to kind of get out of a ransomware attack is really have backups. And if you don't, then you really have to pay the ransom. And and this kind of puts a lot of companies in a in a, in a tough dilemma. Um, so let's let's just assume that companies, the companies that don't have good backups, and now they're in this situation where they've been hit with ransomware. Um, and the only option is paying the ransom. And there are challenges around paying ransoms, Bitcoin, etc. Could you maybe just throw some light on what is the responsible way for companies to uh, approach this? And then what has been your experience? And then where where do we, where are we in terms of the law, right? Sure. Uh, the, the, grief, uh, the grief of that question is, is it legal uh, to pay ransom in India? And uh, if yes, if we have to pay through Bitcoins, how does it go? How, do, uh, one, how does one go about it? See, Bitcoin, as uh, we all have read in the press also and otherwise, uh, it is a gray area. It is uh, even there were uh, issues on, you know, it's, it's, it's at your own risk. They are where it had also given issues, circulars and that was against state also in certain cases. So um, it's a matter of influx right now. Uh, but uh, now it is ultimately if the ball is in the client's court. I mean, what has he done? Uh, has he maintained backups or not becomes essential. If not, then they have to pay through ransom. Uh, the ransom for the ransomware attacks, they have to pay through bitcoins. Um, they do if they have uh, the same, uh, you know, paraphernalia and the board of directors and the board decides to do that to retrieve their data. There have been cases where that has been done. Now, the issues on legality, not illegality, so far. Uh, it's been un brought under regulation, but the thing is still being not, uh, you know, finalized. So it's a gray area. So one does pay, pays out of their own discretion. And then uh, if there were stringent penalties for engaging in the same, it was a different scenario, but that's not the case right now. So uh, the issue here is that what one does to retrieve data, if one uses tools and decryption keys, and if one is able to do that very well, if, done, if not, then I mean, whatever backups are there, use the same. But coming to the law, I mean, when you talk about the law aspect, then yes, introduction of any virus or any kind of malware, uh, stealing of any data or encryption or you know damaging to the, the particular data falls under Section 43, read with 66 of our IT Act, with the punishment of up to three years of imprisonment and fine as a criminal penalty. So that is something which can be invoked. Damages can be invoked if you know the person who's caused this, then in the, that scenario, obviously it's easier than, you know, than just uh, filing a case against a particular IP address. Then the tracking happens and then, you know, you may or you may not be able to find who the person is. So that's also uh, a civil case for claiming of damages. But both civil and criminal uh, remedies lie and if it's uh, stealing of source code, for example, even source code has been stolen, 65 again of IT Act comes into play there. So there again, three years of punishment and fine is there. So that's how uh, the law, the IT Act you know, puts a, takes a position on these issues. So it is up to ultimately the client what legal recourse he or she wishes to pursue. And then you know, we take action based on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings me to the the next question that I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. Are we anywhere close? You are you are interacting with international stakeholders. Are we anywhere close to moving out from the bilateralism and multilateralism uh, to get to somewhere near uh, an international law on the cyber security, or uh, whether it is accepting on the definition of cyber crime or anything uh, related to cyber laws? Are we? Uh, I've uh, for long advocated 
we should be having a you know being a party to the cyber crime convention we are yet not there as such eu has a cyber crime convention but india is not a signatory uh, so far and uh, we need to you know do something more on that there should be a policy there should be a, a framework which uh, you know india needs to call out to really uh, be in the same ecosystem because there are better cooperation mechanisms available with uh, different countries being involved sometimes just having a bilateral treaty may not work and the timelines for general bilateral treaties are very long considering electronic evidence uh, is involved or is in picture uh, having a quicker timeline to respond in is important from law law enforcement point of view having a lesser uh, red tape is, you know, is is also important because so many procedural uh, hurdles are there that you know getting to that final stage and getting the data is becoming a huge challenge for our law enforcers so that's how i view it and we do need a, a, a sort of a consensus on definition of cyber crimes what are those cyber crimes a crime in a particular jurisdiction may not be a crime as per the definition of another country and often we have seen that that uh, you know leads us to uh, a lot of uh, complications in terms of legal actions because unless the two countries agree on this particular incident amounts to a crime how can you think of getting data from that country so that's something one really needs to understand and take note of thank you thank you very much ladies and gentlemen uh, before we thank uh, dr karnika any anyone has any other question she is available to us now she is ready to answer uh, please ask if you have any questions don't leave all the questioning to be done by me otherwise it will appear as if it is a dual may i sir uh, please uh i'm i'm group captain ashok uh, i've seen the draft of personal data protection bill which yes. is slated which has been started from 2019 20 21 maybe we will have it uh, as an act in 2022 the draft has got 543 pages so just on a lighter note how do you re understand and you know uh, contribute to the cause it's, it is such a huge document i understand uh, what what we normally do when we make policies uh, or comment on policies uh, and have helped or contributed government is that first we read the summary note because that summarizes the entire gist of uh, the proposal and often on their side, they have, uh, you know, key suggestions uh, or even comments of other parties. Those are helpful. Uh, but most of the policy documents, whether you see international documents or even India, uh, they would have a short summary or executive summary initially, and then followed with detailed commentaries of every section that they're proposing. So uh, in order to contribute, it is also important to see what area uh, is being covered by uh, you know that particular legislation being proposed and where you are a stakeholder so that for example if i were to look at policy uh, i mean from law perspective we have to look at the entire document but uh, if you're an industry leader or a security specialist or you know from coming from say um, law enforcement uh, you know, police or otherwise army or any other quarters you see the sections which apply to you and your area and then uh, comment because you are well aware and seized of the issues which arise in your sector and your industry and there is where your contribution will come from so that's one of my suggestions uh, rest is definitely i agree that it's a very lengthy document and sometimes you are uh, not able to read the entire length but i think uh, this approach should help because uh, if you understand the entire broad perspective of the same and yet are able to see the area which pertains to you and then contribute, I think your contribution gets made. Thank you, Dr. Say. She has given a shortcut to you. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Anyone else has any question? No. No. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Karnika. Thank you. Uh, very uh, elaborate discussion we had.
and nicely presented. Thank you so much. First of all, taking out time. I know you're very busy person. Uh, at short notice, you have accepted to come and speak to our, our participants. Uh, so nice of you. And it's been wonderful. It's been a great session. On behalf of all the participants, I thank you for this wonderful presentation. And we look forward to your association with ISAC in future also in uh, whatever way so that uh, we can probably uh, you know, benefit the community and the uh, stakeholders can benefit from that. I personally uh, want to thank uh, Isaac for this interaction. Uh, it has given many insights. And with each interaction that we uh, you know, have like this with stakeholders, uh, the nation is built. So you're actually on the Army Day building your nation by doing this. I congratulate Isaac and all of the uh, you know uh, participants today and cohorts. Uh, you know I think uh, uh, I especially would like to thank you all for taking out time to listen to me and interact with me today, because uh, each of you has a huge contribution to make. Whether you're just listening or you're asking questions, you're taking inputs which will help uh, you know us uh, to you know, create a good robust ecosystem system as a country. So we are there to uh, handhold each other's uh, you know, in, in this whole exercise. And that's the reason of having such programs and initiatives. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, this interaction. And I do look forward to interacting with you in the near future. Thank you.